The thermostat in your house is a perfect example of a negative feedback loop system. The temperature goes down in your house, the thermostat triggers the furnace to push warm air out of the vents until a target temperature is hit. Then the thermostat senses this and shuts down the system until the temperature cools to the threshold value again. Believe it or not, a very similar feedback mechanism works in the tissues of the scrotum and spermatic cord that help to regulate the temperature of the testicle. We'll explore this process in our present discussion of the inguinal canal and spermatic cord. Greetings and welcome to this presentation on the inguinal canal and spermatic cord. The inguinal canal represents the inferior most part of the anterolateral abdominal wall. It contains the same myofascial layers as discussed in our previous session of the anterolateral abdominal wall, but they become specialized in this region, so it requires some additional discussion, which is one of the main focuses of this session. In addition, we'll be looking at the spermatic cord and testis. Now, this might seem a little out of place at first, but it actually fits in nicely with the present discussion. In the male reproductive system, the testis is the organ responsible for production of spermatozoa, the haploid reproductive cells. Now, unlike the oocyte, which is the reproductive cell type found in females, spermatozoa require an ambient temperature that is below body temperature for normal development. As a result, during normal reproductive system development, the testis descends outside of the abdominal cavity and comes to rest in the scrotum, where the temperature tends to be a little cooler. As it descends, it creates an evagination through the anterolateral abdominal wall along the path defined by the inguinal canal. And it's this protrusion of the myofascial elements that gets modified to form the components of the spermatic cord. So there you go, makes perfect sense. And since we're already down there, Probably not a bad idea to discuss the testicle itself while we're at it. Objectives for this session. We're going to look at the organization of the inguinal canal and how the myofascial layers identified in the anterolateral abdominal wall session contribute to these layers. We'll then do the same thing for the spermatic cord and include a discussion of the male gonad. And interspersed throughout will be a discussion of the clinical conditions associated with this area of the body. Early in both male and female embryology, undifferentiated gonads develop along the posterior abdominal wall. At the same time, a connective tissue tract known as the gubernaculum also develops, anchoring the gonads to the anteroinferior portion of the abdomen. As fetal development progresses, the gubernaculum retracts, pulling the gonad in this anteroinferior direction. This retraction is much more pronounced in the male, resulting in the descent of the testes through the wall into the scrotum. Postnatally, the gubernaculum persists in the male as the scrotal ligament. In females, this descent is pretty subtle, with the ovaries laying suspended in the posterior abdominal pelvic cavity. The gubernaculum does not retract to a significant degree in females, and degenerates postnatally to form the round ligament of the uterus, anchoring the uterus to the labia majora. So in either case, male or female, we have communication between the abdominal pelvic cavity and the external genitalia. In males, it's the spermatic cord traveling into the scrotum. In females, it's the round ligament traveling into the labia majora. In both cases, though, the channel of communication is the same, the inguinal canal. The inguinal canal is bound and reinforced by the myofascial layers of the anterolateral abdominal wall. The aponeurosis of the external oblique muscle projects inferiorly to form the anterior wall of the inguinal canal. At its inferiormost point, the aponeurosis curves dorsally to form the floor of the inguinal canal. It's also, well, not technically a tendon anymore. That's because the fibers run from the anterior superior iliac spine down to the pubic tubercle. So, connective tissue running between two bones? Yeah, it's now considered a ligament. In this case, the inguinal ligament, which provides structural support to the floor of the inguinal canal. As the inguinal ligament terminates medially at the pubic tubercle, this represents the medial most point of the inguinal canal. At this point, the terminal fibers arch anterior and superior to form the superficial inguinal ring. The spermatic cord and round ligament can be seen exiting the inguinal canal at this point. 
The posterior wall of the inguinal canal is formed by the aponeurosis of the internal oblique and transversalis fascia. In the majority of people, these two tendons are completely fused and referred to as the conjoint tendon. This actually tends to be a weak point in the anterolateral abdominal wall and is not uncommon for a tear to appear in this tendon, allowing abdominal contents to squeeze through, creating a bulge in the wall. This is referred to as a direct inguinal hernia. Medially, the conjoint tendon is anchored to the pubic crest and pectineal line. A projection off the inguinal ligament, the lacunar ligament projects to the conjoint tendon, forming a sling that further supports the medial floor of the inguinal canal. Laterally, the fibers of the transversus abdominis arch over the spermatic cord or round ligament to form the deep inguinal ring, which is the lateral termination point of the inguinal canal. Deep to the conjoint tendon, the transversalis fascia projects inferiorly and blends into the inguinal ligament. In this region, it is typically referred to as the iliopubic tract. This fusion creates a functional boundary between the abdomen and the lower limb, as abdominal contents are not able to project past the inguinal ligament. That covers how the myofascial layers form the inguinal canal. But as mentioned at the start of the session, these myofascial layers also contribute to the structure of the scrotum and spermatic cord. First note that the skin is continuous with that covering the anterolateral abdominal wall, demonstrating how the scrotum can be considered an evagination of the wall. Camper's fascia is that particularly thick layer from the abdomen, which assists with thermal insulation. Well, that's counterproductive for the scrotum, where we actually want to facilitate heat loss. So this layer thins into the thinnest of layers that is not really appreciable from a gross anatomical perspective. Next is the much thinner scarpus fascia. This does continue into the scrotum and is modified to play a critical role in thermal regulation. We need to maintain an ideal below body temperature in the testicle, but let's face it, there are times when the temperature can drop a little too much. This would leave the scrotum and testicle susceptible to frostbite, which would be very counterproductive. As it enters the scrotum, however, the scarpus fascia layer transitions into dartos fascia a thin latticework of small, smooth muscle fibers that resemble netting. If the temperature drops a little too much down there, the dartos fascia contracts, resulting in the entire fascia layer condensing upon itself like shrink wrap. This has four effects on thermal regulation. First, it decreases the overall surface area for heat to radiate from. Second, it thickens the wall of the scrotum, providing a temporary barrier of insulation. Third, it helps to bring the testicle closer to the abdominal pelvic cavity, where it is able to absorb more heat. Finally, the contraction of the muscle tissue would generate a small amount of heat itself to keep the testicle warm. In addition to contracting in cool temperatures, dartos fascia also seems to contract during sexual arousal, which likely plays a role in propulsion of fluids during ejaculation. Deep to scarpus fascia is the external oblique muscle. Now, we just discussed how the external oblique aponeurosis forms the inguinal ligament, which terminates at the superficial inguinal ring. Despite this, a thin layer of fascia originating from the external oblique branches off to join the elements of the spermatic cord as the external spermatic fascia. The same thing can be seen happening with the internal oblique muscle, forming the cremasteric fascia. Unlike the external spermatic fascia, which is strictly connective tissue, muscle fibers from the internal oblique continue into the cremasteric fascia. Because of their vertical orientation, these fibers will contract to elevate the testicle, drawing it closer to the abdominal palate cavity. Again, important for things like thermoregulation and sexual arousal. In addition though, there's the cremasteric reflex. Stroke the inner surface of the upper thigh in the appropriate way, and the cremaster muscle will reflexively contract to lift the testicle. Pretty appropriate reflex when you think about it. Anything that brushes against the inner thigh has potential to do some serious damage to your uh, reproductive abilities. So elevating the testicle away from harm sounds like a pretty good idea. For clinical purposes, it's another way to test the integrity of the lower levels of the spinal cord. More on that in a few minutes. The next layer down is the transversus abdominis. This layer actually does terminate in the abdominal cavity. There is no contribution to the spermatic cord. 
The transversalis fascia continues into the cord as the internal spermatic fascia. The parietal peritoneum forms the processus vaginalis, which leads the testicle as it progresses through the inguinal canal. Postnatally, the processus vaginalis fuses in upon itself to seal off the passage into the spermatic cord, preventing unintended materials from entering the inguinal canal. The fusion is not always 100% effective at keeping things out, and it's not uncommon for abdominal contents to bore their way into the processus vaginalis and through the inguinal canal, coming to rest in the scrotum. This condition is known as an indirect inguinal hernia, and is fairly common in neonates where the processus vaginalis may not be completely fused, or in older obese individuals. So to summarize, the components of the spermatic cord are embedded in the obliterated processus vaginalis and encircled by the three fascial layers, like insulation around a wire, the cremasteric muscle being sandwiched between the external and internal spermatic fascial layers. So what sort of structures are found in the spermatic cord? Well, let's start with the neurovasculature. The testicular artery branches off the descending aorta and projects down the peritoneum to enter the inguinal canal through the deep inguinal ring. From there, it continues into the spermatic cord to supply the testicle. Draining blood away from the testicles are the testicular veins. They look pretty standard in the abdomen, but in the spermatic cord, they have a unique structure that, again, assists with temperature regulation. In each spermatic cord, the vein exits as a series of vessels running in parallel, called the pampiniform plexus, surrounding the artery. This creates a countercurrent arrangement for heat exchange. The artery is carrying blood that is warm to body temperature, which is not ideal for the testicle, as we've discussed. Before it gets to the testicle, however, the blood passes in close proximity to this series of veins carrying blood that has been cooled to the ambient temperature for the testicle. As a result, the venous blood pulls heat from the arterial blood, cooling it before it ever reaches the testicle. As I said, this is a pretty phenomenal arrangement for temperature control. A couple of nerves to discuss that are associated with the inguinal canal and spermatic cord. First is the ilioinguinal nerve. We'll see more of this nerve when we trace its origin during the dissection of the posterior abdominal wall. So this is just a brief introduction. It penetrates through the internal oblique aponeurosis midway through the inguinal canal and accompanies the spermatic cord to provide cutaneous sensation to the anterior portions of the external genitalia and superomedial thigh. A second branch in this region is the genital branch of the genital femoral nerve. Again, we'll go a bit more in depth with this in the session on the posterior abdominal wall, but for now, it's important to understand that this is the principal motor nerve for the cremaster and dartos muscle we just discussed. It enters the inguinal canal through the deep inguinal ring alongside the testicular artery and vein, and is embedded in the deep portions of the cord. The fibers are thin and branched in the cord, so not something that is easy to identify with gross anatomical inspection. That leaves one final structure to talk about, the ductus or vas deferens. This is a thick muscular tube with a relatively small lumen. It's easy to identify by feel during dissection as it has remarkable rigidity due to its muscular nature. It feels like a strand of fine gauge wire between your fingers. It's nourished by the testicular artery off the internal iliac and has a rich sympathetic nerve supply which stimulates peristalsic contractions of the muscle during ejaculation. The vas deferens communicates with the testicle distally in the scrotum. This is where we're going to finish things off. The testicle is an ovoid organ responsible for the production of spermatozoa. We previously discussed its descent through the inguinal canal through the processus vaginalis. Distally, the processus vaginalis opens up as the tunica vaginalis, a thin membranous lining. A parietal layer lines the inner wall of the scrotum while a visceral layer covers the testicle. A thick fibrous connective tissue called the tunica albuginea, because of its white appearance, forms the outer cortex of the testicle. Invaginations of the tunica albuginea divide the testicle into lobules. Within the lobules are the seminiferous tubules, where the spermatozoa are produced. The tubules converge to form the rete testes, and from there, spermatozoa pass into a coiled duct within the epididymis for storage and maturation. I don't know, personally I always thought the epididymis looked like a Davy Crockett style hat. 
It tapers posteriorly as the duct becomes less coiled, and the base of the tail is where it becomes the vas deferens. That's going to do it for this session on the inguinal canal and spermatic cord. In the next session, we dive into the thoracoabdominal cavity, beginning with the pleural cavities and the lungs they contain. Until that time, this has been Dr. Stuart Ingalls. Enjoy the rest of your day.